bit, but as you fully reopen, is it a question of if when it comes to a second wave or is it really a question of when? Thanks for having me on, Erin. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to start by saying how great Germany's response has been so far. It's truly impressive. It's another federal nation and it should be an example to the world. Now, if you relax too early and without sufficient testing, you do risk a second surge. I prefer the word surge to wave because it's a surge that overwhelms healthcare, which is the thing we have to look out for. So the thing which is great about this is that they have testing, so they would hopefully be able to detect it early enough and then maybe make adjustments to what they're doing in order to prevent it. So when you look at what they're doing, um, one just very basic thing they've been doing since the beginning of the United States is not is, is testing, right? I mean, when you, you're, the, the point that you're making here, obviously we're, we're not there and we're not even close to there. When you go through the numbers, Professor, you say the U.S. is just at the beginning of this crisis. And how do you come to that conclusion? Absolutely. This, this is a pandemic and a pandemic um, operates in this way, which is somewhat different because nobody has any immunity to it. And in order to get to the point where you would be able to see the levels of immunity that would be even bringing the reproductive number below one, you would have to see that half the people in the country would have been infected. So when, when, when it, in that context, I want to ask you about where the United States is right now. And, and for this, I just want to explain the, uh, compare the United States to South Korea. James Fowles from the Atlantic, I thought, had a great point today. He looked at on February 20th, you had no deaths in the United States, no deaths in South Korea, which also, of course, has been doing a lot of testing, just like Germany. March 20th, 100 deaths in South Korea, 150 deaths in the United States. Today, 236 total deaths in South Korea, 42,000 deaths in the United States. What do you attribute this to? I attribute it to inaction. I attribute it to the fact that knowing that even though we know that there's a pandemic threat, that there's a virus on the scene, which nobody has immunity to, we just kind of sat around and waited for it to show up. And the thing is, one of the things that is very unpleasant about this is that, like you were saying, the majority of people who get it don't show sufficient symptoms probably that they even know they have it, which means they then transmit it and they transmit it, and then it ends up in a nursing home and it goes crazy. Now, I wanna just put a couple of things to rest here. This is not the flu. This is absolutely not the flu. There have already been more than 10,000 deaths in the city of New York alone. In order to get that kind of mortality from a virus that was like the flu, literally everybody in New York City would have had to have been infected. And as we know, the deaths are still rolling in in New York. This is a very serious pandemic virus, which is currently hitting different parts of the country hard. And if it hasn't hit a part of the country hard yet, chances are it will, unless we maintain our vigilance. And that's why when we keep hearing peak, you know, there's this whole perception, you get to the peak, the mitigation, if it works, it works. And then, you know, you kind of plateau and then you start to come down and then you open Absolutely up a little bit correct. and then you're okay. You're saying that that's misleading and it's, it's, it's much more appropriate perhaps to look at this like a mountain range. Yes, correct. The reason I'm saying that is because of the fact that when you're seeing what's happening in New York at the moment, you know, you've heard the phrase flatten the curve. New York is what flattening the curve looks like. Imagine if, the, imagine if it was worse. Imagine if it was continuing to grow exponentially. Imagine how many more lives would be lost outside of COVID alone from other people not being able to receive the care they need for things like heart attacks. So that is flattening the curve, but it's not the virus that's doing that, that's humans. Every single infection averted at this stage, even if it's just delayed, is a victory over the virus and a victory for us. Now, when it starts coming down, it is not coming down because of immunity, it's coming down because of stuff that we did. And when we stop doing that stuff, chances are, is going to start moving again and start ticking up. And if we don't have the testing, we ain't even gonna know. First we're gonna know is when people start dropping dead in nursing homes. And then again, it'll be too late. We'll just go into this whole weary cycle in which we end up having to do the same sort of stuff we're doing now. Okay. You can do milder social distancing if you do it early enough. All right, Professor Hanage, I appreciate your time. And I appreciate those words. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. And I wanna go now to an incredible story of survival in this. Francis Wilson is 29 years old, went to a hospital in Virginia last month with coronavirus after struggling to breathe. Now, despite being young, again, I wanna say it, 29 years old and having no pre-existing conditions, he ended up spending 10 days on a ventilator.
In fact, his condition was so dire that doctors told his family he likely would not survive and he was given his last rites. But then there was a last ditch effort by his doctors. His condition improved and he is here today to tell his story. And Francis Wilson joins me now. This is an incredible story, Francis. I, I, I know one that hopefully give people a, a, a lot of hope. I mean, you are so young and you were so healthy. I know never in a million years could you have thought that this would be you. How are you feeling right now, first of all? I'm doing great. Well, thank you, number one, Aaron, for, for having me on. Uh, today's been awesome. I felt great physically, mentally. Uh, I, I do recognize that every day is different, and the you know, fact that today was a positive one is just um, a good step in the right direction for me. So, you know, I mean, I, I can't imagine the, the sort of trauma of what you experienced having to go through 15 days in the hospital, 10 days on a ventilator in that kind of induced coma. I mean, I, I, the physical toll is, 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 is hugely traumatic, I'm sure, and you will be dealing with that. What about the psychological toll of that? I'd say the psychological toll has unexpectedly been the harder part for me. Um, when I was under, I didn't under, I didn't re remember most of the stuff that had, had happened to me, which is pretty expected because you know they have you on pretty uh, high sedatives. Um, but on March 26th is when my my condition got to the lowest point that it had been, uh, and that's when I was that's when my family was called in for last visitation purposes, when I received last rites, and I was transferred to um, uh, George Washington University Hospital. Um, and at that point, um, I, I, for some reason, I was able to remember everything that was happening uh, as far as my, my, my dreams of what I was understanding. And I was also able to perceive you know, uh, stimuli around me. Um, and at that point, I believed I died and uh, thought that I was being processed for burial. It was, uh, it was a really tough thing. I mean, I even heard my family um, speaking to me at that point. Um, that was really tough. And it's, it's been hard to come back from that. I mean, just to, your family came in and read you the last rites, and you actually could hear them? Is that is that true? I mean, what, can you even, at this point, even kind of put words around what that was like, that you're separated from them by this glass panel, and you know that they've been told, and then you're now aware that you're going to die? Yeah, I, that was, uh, that was tough. I mean, so at that point, in my dream or hallucination or whatever you want to call it, I had already thought that I had died. Um, and at that point, you know, there's like this pinkish purple light that had spoken to me and told me I had 30 minutes to speak with all my, my loved ones. And at that point I heard, you know, my, my family, so that they, they were on the other side of, of a glass panel and there was a nurse inside the room with a, um, with a phone that they held up to my ear so that they could speak to me. And I remember in this dream state hearing my family say, you know, we love you, Francis. You need to pull through this for us. Um, keep fighting. And I remember feeling frustrated because in my dream state, I thought I was in China as a long story, but I remember being frustrated that I couldn't go back and tell my loved ones back in America what I needed to say because I was stuck there. Um, that was a really, really hard uh, moment for me. And it was one of the most frustrating parts of, of this all. And it's really shaped the way that I uh, moved on and some of the lessons I've learned from this whole experience. And, and now, you know, you sit here as, as a 29-year-old uh, young man and, and thank goodness recovering. And I use the, the, the you know, present tense here because I know it's going to be a process. But, but again, you're the, you're the kind of person that people wouldn't think could get sick from this. And now we see, um, you know, protests. People want to reopen the country, and you're hearing about in Georgia. Um, you know, they're opening this week, and the beaches in Jacksonville. There have been protests in your state of Virginia, Francis. After everything you've been through, what do you say to people who are pushing to reopen quickly? I mean, this is, this is tough because I, I caught this from a friend who, at the time, I believe was asymptomatic. Um, I was asymptomatic for a few days before things really uh, just completely fell off a cliff for me. So there's always that risk, um, and especially you know when, when more people are, are going out um, and not taking the, the same precautions that we're taking now that are you know as effectively as possible are limiting the spread and the impact of this virus. I mean, whenever we lift those those um, those measures, whether it's now, whether it's in the future, there's going to be a risk of a second wave or, um, you know, another peak of this. Um, and it's it's important for us to, to make sure that we have 
advance to the point where we're able to respond to whatever that second wave is. Um, I'm not qualified to speak as to whether that we're there now, but you know, I would, I would, that would involve, you know, having developed a quarantine, understanding how this virus uh, in, or its various strains uh, affect um, humans, and it's so novel at this point that I don't think we're necessarily there yet. And before we go, Francis, what's been the hardest part physically for you in recovery? Physically in recovery, uh, just there's there's been a my, my lung capacity is completely shot. I mean, I was playing soccer before this, and now I'm getting winded just kicking the ball against the wall. I love singing, and I uh, just can't really do it as as well as I wished. Uh, but it's it's coming back. Um, yeah, the right. breath is coming. Back. So we're getting there. All right. Well, Francis, thank you very much for being with us and sharing all this with everyone. Thank you. Thank you.